I've come up with 20 things you should know about corporate crime. And with a tip of the hat to Dave Letterman and to Ralph, let us proceed. Number 20, corporate crime inflicts far more damage on society than all street crime combined. Now the reason this happens is in the healthcare field, in the defense field, is because there's this rule on the books that's in healthcare and defense that says if you are convicted of a major crime, you can be debarred or excluded from federal contracts, which is effective death sentence for a major military contractor and for a healthcare contractor. Uh, so they have to find ways around this. One way, non-prosecution agreement. The other way is number 11. I like this one the best. The, the, the U.S. attorney in Boston is considered tough on crime because he won't, he won't agree to deferred or non-prosecution agreements. He demands that the corporation plead guilty. And he's tough on health care fraud. So most, most cases, the U.S. Attorney's Office in Boston, you'll see a criminal conviction. But you can't plead the, the corporation, the big corporation, because there's mandatory, mandatory exclusion uh, from Medicare if you're convicted of a health care crime. So they find a closet entity within the company that has no business with the government. And they plead that entity. So, for example, Sid Wolf yesterday talked about this case of Purdue Pharma and OxyContin. Anybody from rural America knows about OxyContin. People are addicted to it. And I have a friend, a doctor friend out in West Virginia. Uh, he stopped prescribing OxyContin. He refers all pain medica medications cases out because break-ins, people coming in with bad backs, all kinds of excuses to get their fix of OxyContin. Very addictive. I mean, for cancer patients, it's a lifesaver. Uh, but people, people, are, people without serious illness are getting addicted to it. It's, it's called hillbilly, hillbilly heroin because in, in Appalachia, people are crushing it and getting addicted to it. Anyway, the reason this happened was, as, as a U.S. attorney in, in the Western District of Virginia charged, that um, the manufacturer of OxyContin, Purdue Pharma, was making claims that it is less addictive and less subject to abuse. Um, and that's how they got it into the system. They, th they said it was a better pain medicine because of this. And the company was charged with a crime. Now, the headlines in the paper were, Purdue Pharma pleads guilty to crime. So literally, um, I think the LA Times ran that headline. But Purdue Pharma did not plead guilty to the, to the crime. It was uh, Purdue Frederick. That was the closet, so they wouldn't be excluded. Uh, number 10, corporations don't like, so that's what they like. Deferred prosecution, non-prosecution, and uh, pleading out a closet. What don't they like? Number 10, they don't like probation. And they hardly ever have to deal with supervised probation. One case was, the, the, one, the one case that taught them this lesson was uh, Consolidated Edison. Uh, a number of years ago, pled guilty to an environmental crime. The judge was really upset with the company, uh, found a, uh, probation officer, put, put the company on probation, gave the phone, spread the phone number of the probation officer throughout the company. Anytime something was wrong, employees would call the probation officer. He would come in, try and see what was going on, report to the judge. It was putting the company under the thumb of the judge. Subordination did not like that. That's why we don't see it. They don't like to be, number nine, they don't like to be charged with homicide. Now, I think this has to do with, as you move up the ladder, it's easier for corporations to deal with prosecutors at the federal level than at the state level. There was this Republican prosecutor in Indiana when a, a, a Ford Pinto was rear-ended with three teenage girls coming back from a basketball game. The kids were incinerated because the doors locked and the thing went up in flames. They, they didn't get killed by the... They weren't killed by the crash, they were killed by the incineration. And the company knew that they could have fixed this real easily by putting a simple $4 uh, 
or whatever it was, uh, I don't know how much it was, but it was inexpensive guard so that when, the, when it was rear-ended, it, it wouldn't jam into these uh, bolts in the back and, you know, like a, like a can opener, open the gas tank. Uh, so he brought a homicide charge against Ford Motor Company. They don't, they don't like that. The ju they hired these high-priced high attorneys, uh, went in, hired the best friend of a local judge in Indiana, got the company off. We haven't seen a criminal homicide prosecution against a major corporation since, although there are probably scores of cases that could be, could be brought, including probably the case down in Texas, the BP case that Laura mentioned. Number eight, there are very few career prosecutors of corporate crime. Patrick Fitzgerald, the U.S. attorney in Chicago, was one of them. He recently put away Scooter Libby, and now he's prosecuting Canadian medium Baron, Baron uh, Conrad Black. Uh, and that leads to number seven, most corporate crime prosecutors see their, see their jobs as a stepping stone to greater things. Spitzer, Giuliani moved up the ladder, and most young prosecutors are auditioning when they bring cases for the big defense law firms. Why? They want the big bucks. Um, here's an interesting one, number six, most of these corporate crime report, corporate crime cases you see, it's because the corporate criminals and their lawyers turn themselves into authorities. They want to clear the record. They know that the consequences are not going to be homicide, prosecution, not going to be probation, one of these loophole things. So they turn themselves in. They turn everything over. They cooperate with the federal government to move against the executives. And now you're seeing a lot more executives go to jail. But hands off the corporation. Corporate reputation now is everything. And number five, the market does not take corporate criminal prosecution seriously. And that's why when you see a settlement of these corporate cases, the stock price of the company goes up. You, won't, you don't see that with corporate probation cases, and you don't see that with homicide prosecutions. Number four, the Justice Department needs to start pu publishing every year an annual corporate crime in the United States report. They do every year crime in the United States report, which I go down every year and pick up, nothing about corporate crime, all about burglary, robbery, and so forth. They have to start documenting it as a way to put Congress and the President on notice that it's a serious problem, here it is. They have the information, they should just put a publication out. Number three, we must start asking which, that age-old question, which side are you on? Are you with the corporate criminals or against them? Because right now, most of the professionals in this city are paid for under the control of the corporate crime lobby. Young lawyers come to town fresh out of law school, 25 year olds, $160,000 starting salary in this town. What kind of respect should we give them? Especially since they have many other options working, than working for the corporate criminal. Ralph's uh, colleague, Alan Morrison, who started Public Citizen Litigation Group, just came out with a book called Beyond the Big Firm, Profiles of Lawyers Who Want Something More. There are a lot of options. They don't have to be working for these big law firms representing corporate criminals. Number two, <laughs> almost done here, running out of time. Number two, we need a 911 number for the American people to dial direct the Justice Department to report corporate crime and violence. I call, I, I, I call it, I think we should have 611. Uh, I propose 611 for court, pick up the phone and call corporate crime. Now, what triggered this thought? I was at the Justice Department at the press conference where they announced the indictment of William Jefferson, Congressman William Jefferson from Indiana. He was giving bribes and taking bribes, allegedly. And, uh, you know, he took $100,000, wrapped, wrapped them into $10,000 bundles and put them in his freezer. And so he was indicted. Um, the FBI guy at the press conference says this. His name is uh, Joe Persicini. To the American people, I ask you to take time, read this charging document line by line, scheme by scheme, count by count. This case is about greed, power, and arrogance. Everyone is entitled to honest and ethical public service. We as leaders standing here today cannot do it alone. We need the public's help. The amount of corruption is dependent on what the public will allow. And then he gave the FBI's number, 202-278-2000. Call us, he said, with crimes. So simplify is it, let's simplify it and make it 611. I actually called that number the next morning and I talked to an FBI uh, uh, representative. She was at Council 4. And I said, I just heard on the BBC this morning that 
BAE Systems gave $2 billion to Prince Bandar through the Riggs National Bank on DuPont Circle. She said, are you, are you calling to report a crime? <laughs> and the number one thing you should know about corporate crime, everyone is deserving of justice. Question, debate, <laughs> strategize, yes. But if, God forbid, you are victimized by a corporate criminal, you too will demand justice. And we need a more beefed up, more effective justice system to deal with the corporate criminals in our midst. Thank you.